Welcome to the Nick and Matt Show. Bringing the player interviews you want to hear and the hot topics you want to discuss. Streaming live on the Foundation Podcast YouTube channel, here's Nick and Matt. So this is the first Elite Series event of the year for you. Obviously, you wanted to win, but what was your winning formula? Meaning, how did you accomplish this? Because obviously, you had a game plan. You averaged 1,077 over the course of four rounds. Um, what was your winning formula, and how is your win here going to affect your next tournament appearance? Yeah, so the formula was essentially I'm tracing back to 2018, which, you know, I I feel like my past few seasons have been pretty good, but 2018 was, um, you know, I was having the most fun and I was uh, the happiest with how I played overall. And going into that season, I really, uh, I really wanted to start playing, quote, Sexton golf. Uh, because leading up to that, I got so tired of taking all these unnecessary bogey strokes. And, um, you know, I really just cracked down and I just tried to look at every hole and br- try to break each hole down to a science to where, you know, I'm throwing, I'm throwing the most conservatively aggressive shot there is. Like, obviously, if I want to have a chance to win a tournament, I'm going to have to be somewhat aggressive to compete with, uh, you know, the, the top guys, but at the same time, um, you know, being on lead card and seeing the way Ricky, Paul, and even Calvin plays sometimes is, you know, can be a little reckless and, you know, they're, they're, they throw away strokes up at the top. And I just figured if I can go out and, and play sound throughout the entire round and keep everything under control, you know, that's going to be one that's going to result in, you know, maybe not the hottest score, but it's going to put me, you know, up at the top with a chance. And that's, I proved it perfectly in, uh, in round three, like, uh, in round three where, you know, I really didn't feel like I was doing anything crazy to my own standards. Um, but I was just throwing the shot in front of me. And if there was like a, a shot that I, you know, shouldn't have gone for, or, uh, you know, some danger. I feel like I, uh, I managed it really well. Um, mm-hmm. but you know, when that happens, usually I can kind of relax into a groove. And then, you know, if, if I start making shots, if I'm starting to feel confident putting, then I can roll with that momentum and ultimately, you know, you go, go into warp, sp- warp speed, which I, which I felt like I kind of did, uh, the back nine of round three and, uh, you know, to start the, uh, the, uh, the round in, um, in round four. Yeah. So you finished in the round three, you finished 10 down through the last nine holes, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One crazy stat that I was, I heard I, the like for a certain stretch, I was 17 under on 17 holes. Mm -hmm. If we traced back. So I needed, I needed to birdie hole six on the end of a course to get, go 18, like 18 birdies in a row yeah. or 18 <laughs> understrokes and, and, and if, 18 if pe- holes. So. If people don't know which one hole six is on the end of a course, it's the one where we play twice. Hole six is actually technically the shortest course that we played throughout the whole tournament. So what you're saying is that you missed the birdie on the easiest hole Eagle. <laughs> I'm just, I'm messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that, but no, it was, was it was a massive was, it was a massive headwind. So yeah, I was um, I was the only. Or Ricky made the island as well, but there was no birdies on that hole. Yeah, funny enough, no, I do I do remember that. So let me ask you this: Was there something that clicked for you halfway through round three? Because this is what you're talking about as far as how many birdies in a row. It seemed to me, as a viewer, that something might have clicked. You obviously went um, perfect beyond perfect 10 under on the back nine of round three. And then you proceeded to only par as your worst five other holes from that point out. So from round three, half back nine, that's a lot of birdies. Like something seemed to have clicked. I I actually asked Simon this. Yes. I'm name dropping. I was talking with Simon during the round and I said, Simon, did something click for him? Because what happened there? Like, so just fill us in. Did you, did you feel anything different? Um, I definitely felt something, uh, 
I can kind of looking back. The front nine of round three was really slow for me, and it was honestly a, a big struggle. Uh, I think on the front nine, it was only two under, and I, I was kind of falling behind. I think at one point, uh, Calvin was beating me by five strokes. I was just thinking, gosh, all you all you need to do is just start start getting birdies. Like in Vegas, it's you know, pars are almost like bogeys because you know if you're not birding a hole, someone else is. Uh, so. I would. I started today at 23 under par, um, and my main goal was to get to 30 under. So uh, you know, it's two under. I was just thinking, uh, you know, going through the the course in my head and like thinking, oh, there's a there's the par five, there's uh this easy par three, and I was just trying to run through scenarios in my head on how I could get seven under out of the round so I could get to 30 because. Um, you know, I, I felt like uh, 40 under would be a pretty good score for the for the weekend. So if I got to 30, that meant all I had to do was shoot 10 under the next day to get to 40. But, you know, I I hit an outside circle putt on I don't know what hole it was. Um, it might have been hole. It, it was nine or 10, uh, but it was a putt that I didn't think I was going to make. And then, uh, you know, that kind of got the juices flowing. Um, there was an easy par four that I got I got an easy three on. And then I think this is really where the momentum all started was the, the par five to so either 11 or 12. I threw like a, I, I did, I, I used my Bushnell range finder to look back on how far I threw, uh, threw a roller. It ended up being around 750 feet. And I had like a really easy four end approach to get an Eagle. And then all of a sudden I just, I built on that and it, you know, my, the rest of the car just kind of, you know, I don't know, if they were in their own heads or maybe I got in their head, but I just felt like, uh, you know, I separate, I started to separate myself from the group and I just felt like I was, um, I was the, the pacemaker. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So it seems to me, it was pretty apparent that the rest of the card in the final round wasn't keeping up. Okay. So it seemed about maybe whole four or five. Is that what it seemed like to you? And then I guess I would say, at what point did you kind of feel like or realize maybe you were running away with it? Because that's the appearance that was there. It was like, again, talking with Simon, because we were doing a, a live companion feed thing. We were both like, it's over. <laughs> it's over. Like, he's seven or eight strokes ahead, six holes left. Like, so, but at what point for you did that happen? So, yeah. I I I kind of got excited on hole four slightly. Um, it's when Calvin Calvin got a bogey, I got a birdie, and then all of a sudden, within four holes, I was up five, and I think I was up five on Paul as well. And just right away, I was like, "Oh my gosh, this isn't." I'm playing with uh, the the three highest rated players in the world, and wasn't here but i thought there was going to be fireworks i thought it was going to come down to the end and all of a sudden it's like five stroke this is kind of yours to lose now and i just kind of uh you know i knew there was a lot of uh, easy easy par fours out there so i was just thinking you know if you can just put your drive in the fairway you know a lot of the times you're almost just throwing a jump putt approach so if you can just lock those down you know the chances are you're going to win um but you know it, it wasn't that easy you know Believe it or not, like a five-stroke lead, that is very substantial. But at the same time, you are kind of running through all these scenarios. You're a little bit nervous in your head thinking, you know, you know, if if I double bogey and, you know, uh, another competitor birdies, that's, that's three strokes. It's down to two. So, you know, you're going through all these scenarios in your head. So I just kind of told myself, you know, um, you know losing one stroke is okay, whether that means uh, I bogey they par or – birdie i par um that's okay it just you really got to avoid you know uh making an, an a mistake and uh with more than one one more than one stroke so i just mm-hmm. really uh i really just tried to put my shots in, in the in the right places and it, it ended up working and the, one other thing was whole whole six when uh, calvin threw out of bounds and paul i think took a five at that point i was like okay you know this is a uh, the holes are starting to run out now and I'm starting to like my chances. Mm-hmm. So I think, and you can, you know, do you feel like you had an advantage going into that last round, birding the first five holes to start? You had built up a little cushion now. 
the wind was massive on the final day. And so now players that are falling behind have to start playing a lot more aggressive to make sure they're putting themselves in birdie opportunities. Do you felt like, do you feel like because you had a five or six stroke lead at some point, you were able to play a little bit safer in the sense of, you know, my drive's not exactly where I need it to be. So you don't have to be as aggressive on this upshot, but you're still going to put yourself in a chance to potentially birdie. But like you said, pars are still good. Yeah, exactly. That's, um, that's what happened. And it was also kind of interesting. I felt like early on, I kind of, I kind of broke my competition to a certain extent. Like every time they pushed or tried to do something, you know, even if they matched me on the whole, they weren't making up any ground. And I feel like that kind of, you know, frustrated them and they were trying to push. And then, you know, some of them, you know, I, I know Paul kind of did it. Calvin did it. Uh, they kind of started to do a little bit of a tailspin. So, you know, mm -hmm. I think just putting the pressure on them early on and not messing up, that was, uh, that was key for me to, you know, I don't, I don't know what was going through their heads, but I felt like I got in their heads. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. So at what point, at what point did um, the throwing the tilt and then throwing it upside down, at what point did that enter your mind? Um, tell us about that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, coming down the stretch and I was up seven strokes. I I could have I could have almost thrown any shot I wanted to. I wanted to I wanted to do something flashy, but I I still wanted to potentially get a birdie just for my own uh my own greedy reasons. Uh, but you know, messing around with the tilt, looking at the way the shot lined up, like, you know, this is the perfect time to to showcase something that, you know, a lot of people haven't seen before. So I was like, you know, what, what better time than this? You're not, you're not going to want to throw that shot, you know, any other time than, you know, being up knowing you have it in the bag or some double mm -hmm. doubles fun shot or whatever. But, you know, it, it just felt like the, the perfect, perfect thing to do at the time. And I just said, you know, let's, let's, let's have at it. Let's have some fun. So, yeah, there you go. so you're saying you're basing it off of, you knew your lead and it literally went through your head that, I can throw any shot I want to. Like, that's what went through your head. And then you started thinking through, like, okay, what shot am I going to throw? And I'm going to pull out a tilt. So, like, Simon and I doing the companion feed, we're, he's like, I hope to throw. He, he has the tilt. And then you pulled it out, showed it to the camera. And, and again, you know Simon. He's like, he's like, he threw the tilt. Like, he's so happy. Like, you'll have to go watch that companion feed. It's pretty funny. But um, anyways, so that's really, really cool. You did that. Um, some people are calling it a flex and like, as in you flex to show, you know, and, and disrespecting people on your card. Do you feel that at all? I do not feel that at all. It was completely for fun. And I, it's funny, I've been reading a lot of comments regarding that. And everyone's like, well, why would you do a shot like that? Do you, the reason why I did it is because it's funny. the, when are, when, when are you going to get another opportunity to throw a disc upside down on the, the lead card at a pro tour? <laughs> like it's your, it would be a really bad idea unless, you know, for some reason that shot has some benefit. Maybe it like slides on the slides on its, um, on the bottom and it creates some cool shot. And I just felt like it was a, you know, it's not as crazy as it seems like, Anyone on that card could throw the tilt upside down and it would fly like that. It's not unique to me. Um, you know, all you need is a little bit of imagination and you can do crazy things with that disc. So, you know, I wasn't disrespecting anybody on the card. I just wanted to do something fun, uh, you know, for the fans, for my own sake. Um, you know, I'm when it, comes, when it comes down to it, I'm a disc golf nerd. I want to throw funny and cool shots that, uh, you know, impress myself. So. That, for sure that's what it came down to for sure and and i'm just asking the questions man i think i personally <laughs> i personally thought it was epic and i was just as excited to watch it as well 